my anxiety level would have been uh, that my anxiety level would have been much greater because Rajiv writes to me daily uh, about the situation in India. Oh. And Rajiv, you are looking brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Have you just come from your grandmother's temple or working on your grandmother's temple? <laughs> okay. No, okay, Raju. Oh, all right. Thanks. Hi, uh, Professor Raju and Dennis T. Also, uh, this is my intro to Professor Raju. Hello. And uh, great, great fan of your work. Uh, I, I was telling Dennis T., especially the one on Aurobindo and Swaraj, which we made okay. exchange. And of course, Hi, Dennis. It's nice to see you in this in this medium. Yeah, it was um, it was Rajiv who told me about the extension extensiveness of your background, Professor Raghu, and intimidated me. Actually, he said, "Watch out! This man is going to have a lot of tough questions for you uh, because he has he has such extreme admiration uh, for your work." and uh, for your performances. So Rajiv, thank you for preparing me for this. Among <laughs> no, but I told you that uh, I am uh, a product of, uh, you know, the seeds of, uh, you know, reading your book. So <laughs> 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 you're always, uh, you know, in the mode of learning rather than, you know, anything else. <laughs> And Rajiv, were you on when I waved this book in front of me, which is the classic text that I used by Professor Raghu? I don't know if you saw that, uh, but see, I should put this here. Yeah. Here, I just got a little text there. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, and that is how much I benefited from it. So tell me more about how you have been affected by. Uh, the, cat the catastrophe in India uh, that is the way in which COVID has hit so hard. The second wave uh, uh, took uh, India by surprise. So the state was a bit complacent uh, and the people were careless. Uh, they didn't estimate uh, the kind of problem that will come. But I think uh, compared to uh, all other countries in the world, India did extremely well in the first wave because, you know, living in the villages and all, you know, the health infrastructure is very low and all that. I think we did a remarkably uh, re equipped ourselves in a matter of uh, one or two months. Uh, that phase was very, very, uh, you know, um, astonishingly uh, surprising uh, the way in, uh, India prepared itself from. Uh, negative uh, medical facilities to, uh, you know, uh, jacking up supplies. But I think, you know, second wave was very disappointing, both in terms of uh, planning with the government and also people. I mean, the civil society uh, just didn't uh, realize how bad the pandemic can be. So that's the <laughs> thing. But now I think we are, that's, you know, even today, people seem to be thinking that uh, the pandemic is a weak, weak weekend and we are also going to get back to work on Monday. They don't realize that it is not going to be like that. You know, this is, uh, we don't know whether we are fortunate to be in this uh, unprecedented uh, suffering or uh, unfortunate being in the unprecedented suffering. So we're not estimating properly the, the deep, uh, an extensive damage that this pandemic has caused. You've just articulated well, uh, Raghuji, the situation here in America, and that is that we underestimated it, of course, uh, and then we managed to cope with it, and then finally now we've deluded ourselves into thinking uh, that somehow the Delta variant is not going to devastate us, and it is now racing through the United States, yes. as you probably heard. And uh, there are so many people, more in the United States than any other country, who are against vaccinations for political reasons. Uh, that is the correlation between the states that voted for Trump and the states that are not having vaccinations uh, is close. 
And so we have this terrible politicization of the disease uh, that is frightful. It's divided the society. It has now been torn apart by these factions of the pro-vaccination and the anti-vaccination groups. Now, you don't have that degree of factionalism, do you, Raghuji? Yeah, the uh, uh, you know the um, uh, the suspicion about vaccine um, in India has two facets. One is uh, the people who are opposing it are very few compared to uh, the number in America, but people who are ignorant about vaccination are many in India. So we have a double uh, uh, task of uh, convincing people, uh, uh, you know, who knows about vaccination and don't want it, and convincing people who don't know about vaccination and then, you know, asking them. So you know, it's a very, uh, uh, very difficult task in India, and it is not going to be, uh, uh, it is not going to be finished in a very fixed time frame, time frame. So that's exactly. my. Yeah, I, it's exactly in accord with what I'm thinking too, uh, but in American context. And uh, as I said, I'm most troubled by the way in which it has been politicized. That's the awful nature of it because we have enough, as you can imagine, we have enough problems uh, here in the United States with factionalism, but now COVID adds to it. And that's the frightful situation that we have. I don't know. Uh, how it's going to be resolved. Uh, that is the degree of political division, divisiveness in the United States. It's far worse than I've ever seen it in my long life. You are a young man, Raghuji, compared to me. And uh, you uh, know what it's like in India to face this degree of divisiveness. Ah, oh, Sanjeev, you back. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. There are some, you know, <laughs> adjustments to be made, and then therefore I was away. Uh, but uh, I think everything is in order now, and, and great to see you all. Our principal sir has also joined uh, Professor Bake. So I welcome you all, and I think we can begin the proceeding now. Uh, 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 Honorable Principal Professor Masrul Ahmed Bake, uh, Professor Dennis Dalton, uh, Professor Raghuram Raju. Uh, distinguished guests, colleagues, and dear students. Uh, I, uh, I welcome you all at the fourth edition of the Distinguished Lecture Series uh, organized by the Gandhi Study Circle, Zakir Hussain Delhi College. Uh, the idea of the Distinguished Lecture has been introduced with the objective uh, to deliberate on the Gandhi's uh, legacy of inclusiveness uh, that underlines Gandhi's philosophy. Uh, the previous three lectures, uh, you may know, uh, have been delivered by Professor Akhil Bilgrami, uh, Professor Faisal Devji, and Professor Bhikkhu Parekh. Uh, as we bring this initiative, uh, we are also reminded uh, of the extraordinary crisis uh, that our country is pledged, uh, plunged into today. Uh, we take this mom moment uh, to remember all whose lives have been cut short and affected uh, by the deadly uh, coronavirus. Our heart uh, goes to our dear colleague, uh, Dr. Om Prakash, who unfortunately is no longer today, uh, but was a motivating force uh, behind all these initiatives. Uh, we need to also remind uh, that India's unfolding catastrophe has resulted much from the failings of the deadly pandemics, as also from the failure of the socio-political system uh, to respond adequately uh, to the needs of the vulnerable and marginal sections of the Indian society. At such a crucial, crucial juncture, uh, when material uh, teleological ends uh, have gained credence over the commitment to ethics and service, uh, Gandhi's humanism uh, serves as a moral campus. In our constant endeavor uh, to engage Gandhi's thought and praxis, in the last one decade of its working, uh, Gandhi's study circle has made considerable progress. Uh, we now bring you a brief snippet of our modest journey.
Thank you. Uh, uh, now I request our Honorable Principal, uh, Professor Baig, uh, to offer his preliminary, preliminary uh, welcome remarks. Welcome, sir. Am I audible? Uh, Professor Baig? Or am I audible to you? Yeah. I'm afraid I think there's some technical issues uh, because of which I think he's unable to connect. Uh, he was here. Uh, maybe he will join us uh, shortly. Uh, so uh, I think we can uh, continue with the proceedings. Uh, uh, we are extremely privileged uh, uh, to have amongst us uh, today very two, I mean, two very eminent scholars uh, whose life and works uh, have been a great source of inspiration. It is an honor to introduce uh, the chair for this important session, uh, Professor A. Raghuram Raju. Coming from a very humble uh, rural setting, Professor Raghu, Raghu, Raghu has worked his way uh, to become one of the leading political philosophers of the contemporary period. Uh, professor Raghu is currently professor at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, Indian Institute of Technology, Tripathi. His work engages a wide spectrum of issues in modern political philosophy, history of political thought, uh, technology and society, inequality, justice, and rights. His writings on the themes of religion, colonial modernity, nationalism, Gandhi and Vivekanand 
have produced new perspectives and contributed uh, significantly to our intellectual debates. Uh, the keynote speaker of the day, uh, Professor Dennis Dalton, as you may all know, is a political theorist of international eminence and scholarship. Currently, he's Professor Emeritus of Political Science at Barnard College, uh, Columbia University. His diverse field of interest include classical and modern, Western and Asian political theory, politics of South Asia, particularly the Indian nationalist movement, nonviolence and violence in society, and ideologies of modern political movements in Europe, India, China, and Africa. But I must say, uh, Mahatma Gandhi has remained a topic of special interest to him. Uh, Professor Dalton has edited and contributed uh, to more than a dozen publications and has written numerous articles among his most critically acclaimed book, uh, Indian Idea of Freedom and Mahatma Gandhi, Non-Violent Power in Action, have remained of great interest to all of us. Uh, Professor Dalton has also been honored uh, with numerous teaching awards, scholarships, and grants. Uh, the paucity of time uh, constrained me to speak much on the legacy of both these uh, distinguished scholars. I'm truly honored and humbled at their presence uh, to address uh, today's webinar, uh, which is on the theme, Indian Ideas of Freedom. We do have a rich Indian intellectual tradition, uh, but the Indian canon has seldom received the attention it deserves. Uh, drawing from the conceptual correspondence among seven creative Indian minds on the core ideas of freedom, uh, Professor Dalton's lecture today uh, will draw upon the rich legacy of India's tradition of political thought. Uh, before I request the chair uh, to introduce the theme and take the proceedings forward, I quickly want to make a few announcements. Uh, participants are requested to keep their audios off uh, during the conduct of the proceedings. After the lecture, we'll have an interactive section uh, for 30 minutes. Uh, this will be moderated by our friend Viprajit. Uh, the question, comment, and observations can be uh, shared on the chat box. Uh, we will appreciate if you come live on the screen and address your concerns directly. But please be brief and relevant to the theme. The participants are also requested uh, to fill the uh, feedback form. Uh, uh, now, not taking much of time, uh, may I now request uh, Professor Raghuram Raju uh, to offer his introductory remarks and conduct uh, the session. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, um, uh, uh, Dr. Sanjeev, uh, for uh, asking me to uh, chair the session. It's such an honor uh, 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 to do this thing, uh, Professor Baig and Professor uh, Dalton and friends. <laughs> One way to look at uh, today's presentation is to look at how do we enter into the kind of work that Professor Dalton has, uh, uh, has initiated long back. And that is not an easy uh, entrance to envisage. I will begin with a personal note that when as a student of philosophy, political philosophy, I was uh, toying with the idea of uh, what to do uh, on what topic to research on. And there are several uh, options. Uh, uh, one was to take uh, what I call as the floodlight, you know, uh, areas where uh, things are ready-made uh, available to you. And you go and uh, start your work right, uh, um, you know, immediately. It is, but then I was not very happy with that because that doesn't gel with the idea called research. And then I was, uh, as uh, the ergonomics of the body dictates, we also sometimes not only see what is in front of us, we also look away from what is in front of us. Too frequently looking away, which is not a good job and teachers would not like students looking away from what is kept in front of them. I came across uh, two important markers. 
One is I read the essay by Ashish Nandi, The Final Encounter, and then I really moved away from the floodlights research that was in front of me. And then I then looked a little more into that small sparks of light, which is available in a distant mode. It is at that time I came across this book by Professor Dalton <clears throat> called Mahatma Gandhi, Nonviolent <clears throat> Power in Action and uh, a power, Nonviolent Power and uh, a Power in Action. That really changed me and convinced me to say that it is possible to do academic philosophy, taking Indian thinkers, but on the global platforms, not you know doing Gandhi, you know like a Pravachan Gandhi, but bring him on par with uh, and on you know published papers in political science journals and philosophy journals and things like that. So <clears throat> that is a kind of a <clears throat> you know uh, <clears throat> beginning that I had to start with. Now now you see that. What, what kind of impact Professor, Professor Dalton can have on a generation of people like us and with me, a lot of other people. So that's how I, 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 I wanted to just begin the, uh, the introducing the theme. So he, in my understanding, he's one of the very few early warriors on behalf of, uh, you know, Indian philosophy, particularly modern Indian thinkers who are not, as he rightly says in his essay, are not systematic armchair philosophers like Marx Miller, you know, uh, John Rawls or anybody else, but they are very activists. One of the important things that one finds in uh, Professor Dalton is to say that if somebody is not uh, a, 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 a systematic philosopher, you don't look away from him or her, okay? If somebody is not a systematic philosopher, the question that you should ask is, can this non-systematic philosopher <clears throat> be made into, converted into a systematic philosopher? That is a fundamental subtext that one reads in the writings of Professor Dart. So you have to be, if you are an young scholar today, you have to not only address the question, who is a systematic philosopher, but also raise the question, can somebody who is in front of me, can be converted and presented as a systematic philosopher? I think if you get an affirmative answer to that, then I think your achievement is guaranteed before you start your work. Before you start your work. Now, let me just, with that brief note, let me just uh, bring in the larger context into the scene. The larger context is that with the, the modernity was carried to India by colonial canyons. And when colonialism brought modernity to India, the implication was that India is now connected at a global level. So Indian knowledge cannot be only for the purpose of domestic requirements. It has to now reckon with the global standards. Now, at that time, when it was exposed, related and connected to the global standards, its standing was not very promising. It was very, very bleak, very, very bleak. The, the amount of work that one could present at a global platform was not very promising, not very promising. Then comes a phase of the Orientalist who tried to present Indian text in translation and that created the initial elbow room in the relationship between India and the global platform. But even then, if you look at closely into the, the Oriental text, the Oriental texts were largely on the classical Indian texts. There are not many who are ready to look at the modern Indian 
you know, text or modern Indian people. I think it is, there are very few people who are working on India and fewer still who are working on contemporary India. Professor Denise Dalton is one of those first batch of people who embarked on this job of looking at these people like Gandhi and others and asked by this question, it is not whether Gandhi is a philosopher, but is it possible to present Gandhi as a systematic philosopher? Because I am an, uh, an academician. My job is not to use the ready-made uh, you know, uh, food, but make, prepare the food. And I think it is a very interesting and a very seminal and a quite you know, an important question that people like Dalton have asked, raised that question. And it is in this context that we find, uh, for instance, uh, Professor Dalton's contribution is enormous. It opened our windows, not only into the translated text of the Orientalists for the, for, for the European scholarship, but also segregated and analyzed you know, in a very uh, systematic manner, the insights and the perceptions and the worldviews that underlies the modern Indian, I call, I make a distinction between a writer and an author. Okay, one of the significant uh, aspects in the world about India is 19th and 20th century have produced a very interesting combination that doesn't have parallels in the world. And that is most of the national leaders also happen to be the writers. Gandhi's 100 volumes, you know, Ambedkar's 30, Aurobindo's 30, Vivekananda's nine and numerous other things. You have great philosophers in the world, better than the people I, whom I mentioned. You have great politicians in the world, but politicians writing in such large, you know, corpus of writing is rare in the world. And, but then they are writers. But the question that Professor Dalton asked and people like Dalton asked at that time was, as I said, that is it possible to convert these writers into authors? And he did a remarkable job, remarkable job you know, sitting in Columbia University and not talking about John Rawls and um, Eza Berlin, but talk about Gandhi is not a joke. It is not a joke. It is something, you know, where it is almost like, you know, climbing uh, Everest after trekking Western Ghats. It is not that easy. It is not that easy. You have to have a courage. You have to have a perseverance. You should have a commitment. You should have insights. You should have a rigorous rigor of scholarship without which this odious task is impossible. I think that is how I find uh, uh, a really, I'm, I'm a beneficiary. So I, in that sense, I'm ill-suited to introduce him because you need somebody who is equal in stature to introduce him. But then, you know, I'm a very greedy person. So when uh, Sanjeev said that, you know, please uh, do this job, I said, oh, maybe if not now, then I will never. So I grabbed this uh, opportunity. And uh, now I find, so I now see Professor Dalton as a warrior who returned after making successful contributions to the war that he waged, you know, early in his life. And then it is a, a warm welcome to the successful warrior uh, back home, you know, making uh, a, a, another presentation. And now he comes now, not only after the success, I think he's now, when I see his presentation, I find that he has another agenda for another war, you know, and that is in addition to Gandhi, he has included six more people, you know, uh, and whom he calls as uh, the, uh, the group of seven. My teacher, Professor Ramchandra Gandhi, who admitted me to philosophy, otherwise, you know, nobody would have admitted me to philosophy because I had a Telugu medium background. He is the one who admitted me to philosophy. He called 
a group of these people, not the same, same group, there's some overlap, uh, seven sages, uh, seven sages. So when I read um, uh, the lecture where you said that the group of seven, I also thought that two things came to my mind. One is the um, Akira Kurosawa's seven samurai, and then <laughs> Ramchandra Gandhi's seven sages. It is such an honor, such an honor to uh, uh, introduce Professor Dennis Charlton. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sanjeev, uh, for asking me to do this job. Thank you once again. Looking forward for Professor Dalton's exciting presentation to you. Yeah, it is indeed an honor for all of us. I think both of you, you know, uh, you know, enlightened scholars, you know, and today to have both of you here, you know, in the same, you know, platform, I think it will be a great experience for all of us, you know, uh, who are learners of Indian political philosophy. Uh, so, uh, not taking much of a time, uh, I would like to uh, now uh, uh, request uh, Professor Dennis Dalton uh, to deliver his keynote address on the theme India's ideas of freedom. Professor Dennis Dalton, welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Raghuji, because. I'm actually overwhelmed by what you just said in calling me a warrior. I wish that you could know the full extent of how profound your remarks just were. I would have to relate uh, the way in which I waged a battle at Columbia University to include Gandhi in the core curriculum. And after 40 years there, finally succeeded. It was a struggle because Gandhi, as compared with, you mentioned you know, the other stages of the West, John Rawls, et cetera, he and the others were dismissed. In terms of the other members of the by group of seven that you referred to, uh, it would be unheard of for them to be included in the sacred Western canon, Eastern Asian canon of the core curriculum at Columbia. <clears throat> so you've entered into the spirit, Professor Raghuji, perfectly with what I'm about to say. And I thank you. First, of course, I must express my sincere gratitude to Professor Sanjeev Kumar, because Sanjeevji, your excellence as a writer, is matched by your admirable perseverance as an organizer. Some of you may not know that the attempt that you made to deliver this lecture uh, was way back in April 30th, and it had to be canceled at the last minute because of COVID. Uh, then you persisted, and here we are tonight, and I'm delighted then to be with you. Uh, Professor Raghu, your reader, has been indispensable to me in teaching my courses at Columbia and Barnard. It's a model for understanding the vibrant exchange of ideas that has enriched our study of thought. It's the conceptual organization uh, that you constructed in this reader. And this, of course, is only one of your many writings, but it definitely applies to today's subject. It's that introduction in which you so brilliantly introduced uh, this debate over Gandhi. Uh, that is the way in which it became so compelling to my students that I assigned it year after year for my courses. And so it is my honor tonight for you to, I'm saying tonight because it is tonight here in Portland, Oregon, um, but it's this morning for you. And uh, it's an honor on my part to have you chair this lecture. Now today I'm coming to you from thousands of miles away on the west coast of the United States. And yet in all the years that I've lived with my family in India, beginning in 1960, I've never felt closer in spirit to you than now. And this is because of the mixture of grave concern and deep empathy of both sadness and of hope over the COVID catastrophe that has swept India. I must 
add to this that my anxiety would be much worse if it weren't for reassuring emails from Dr. Rajiv Kadambi, my close friend and most conscientious correspondent who contacts me regularly uh, telling me of the situation there. And finally, before beginning my lecture, I must say how fortunate I feel to have had the benefit, as indicated in the video before that we saw, of following the other speakers in this series. Professors Bhikkhu Park, Akhil Bhagrami, and Faisal Devji, you have each given me a rich learning experience, and I am deeply grateful to you as well, and as I said, fortunate uh, to be able to follow you in this. Now, the main theme of my lecture has already been announced by Sanjeevji, and that is the Indian ideas of freedom, and it examines common ground among selected modern Indian political thinkers uh, that I've called, as Raghuji just said, uh, the group of seven. And these are Swami Vivekananda, uh, Sri Aurobindo Ghosh, Mahatma Gandhi, Rabindranath Tagore, M. N. Roy, B. R. M. Baker, and uh, Jai Prakash and Ryan. Now, why have these figures been chosen? You certainly may have chosen students and scholars of the subject, others, but I've chosen them because, to my mind, they meet high standards of political thought, a subject that I've taught for over 50 years at universities in England and the United States and South Asia. These seven Indian thinkers have pondered deeply and published voluminously on universal concerns of political thought. That is, on major ideas that have dominated such thinking for millennia. And these ideas include the essence of human nature, the pursuit of truth, how society should be constituted, legitimate grounds of political authority, core concepts of freedom, equality, and justice, and desirable methods of change. In this case, of these seven Indian thinkers, who, as Professor Raghu mentioned so compellingly, who have not been included in the Western canon at all, in the case of these seven thinkers, they have drawn vital, often original, conceptual correspondences among these ideas. And Professor Rago, you could not have hit it better when you said that these are not, in the Western sense, regarded as systematic philosophers. And yet, I take it as the highest compliment for you to say that I have attempted to convert them into thinkers of the highest stature because they established and enhanced a long intellectual tradition that served to invigorate the Indian nationalist movement. Now the differences among these seven thinkers uh, should be apparent to any serious reader of their extensive writings. However, their similarities are less recognized. So they'll be presented here as constituting a constellation of ideas. This theoretical cluster focuses on how their core ideas about freedom cohere with other associated conceptions. And these are the relationship of means to ends, the search for self-transformation, models of nonviolent change, and ethics and politics. Now we begin our analysis with Gandhi because this lecture series has featured him already, as I've said, with distinguished scholars, and I hope to build on uh, their contributions. Among this group of seven, Gandhi is preeminent as the main national leader who put his ideas into practice. With extraordinary creativity, as you know, Gandhi conceived a conceptual paradigm that defined Indian meanings of freedom. And this started with his thinking about freedom in Hinds Rock in 1909, as most, if not all of you know. He introduced here his classic distinction between inner 
and outer freedom. The relationship of Swaraj as self-rule to Satyagra as truth force or soul force. Now Gandhi brought to the fore not only the correlates of inner, inner and outer uh, freedom, but also the conceptual correspondences among these ideas that bear repetition. So once again, first, freedom is both internal and external liberation. Second, an imperative that means are preeminent, taking priority over ends. Third, nonviolence is the right method of change. And finally, ethics <clears throat> as being integral to politics. In Gandhi's short treatise of, of Hinswaraj, he created a remarkable synthesis of these ideas. It was written at white heat during a sea voyage from England to South Africa. And it was composed not by a philosopher, but by a lawyer who was only age 40. This consequent nexus of ideas appears as the brightest star in a constellation of Indian political thinkers, leaders of a renaissance of political theory and practice in the last century. Gandhi's way of thinking about freedom thus appeared relatively early in his life, and not only in his public pronouncements, but his personal correspondence as well. So in 1910, only a year after he wrote in Swaraj, he advised a nephew privately who was earnestly committed to India's independence. And I quote from Gandhi's writing in his letter to his nephew, please do not carry unnecessarily on your head the burden of emancipating India. Emancipate your own self. Even that burden is very great. Nobility of soul, he continued, consists in realizing that you are yourself India and your emancipation is the emancipation of India, end of quote. <clears throat> this correlate of self and system became his signature theme and whatever inconsistencies or conceptual developments marked his intellectual evolution after, this idea of freedom and the cluster of thought around it never changed. And so in 1931, Following the salt satyagraha, he wrote, quote, the outward freedom that we shall attain will only be in exact proportion to the inward freedom to which we have grown at a given moment. This is the correct view of freedom, end of quote. And so outer or inner freedom meant both Indian independence and more. As an independent movement, it was necessarily joined by social reforms. That is his repeated three pillars of Swaraj, Hindu Muslim unity, abolition of untouchability, and economic equality. The necessary correlate is an inward form of Swaraj that demanded rigorous, sometimes agonizing reappraisal, as when Gandhiji called it a painful climb, to quote his phrase, in life's arduous, endless pilgrimage, a search for truth through ceaseless experimentation, subject to the theory and practice always of nonviolence. Meanwhile, Aurobindo and Tagore both expounded this formulation of internal and external freedom coincident with Gandhi's thought. Now, there were other thinkers, of course, like Vipin Chandra Pal, who used this language of freedom. Even before Gandhi wrote in Swaraj, in his Madras lectures, for example, of 1907. And yet, Vipin Chandra Pal never created the theoretical synthesis achieved by the group of seven. Others like B.G. Tillock or C.R. Das or Srandranath Banerjee, Lajpad Rai, they 
were important, of course, thinkers in the movement, but they did not achieve what I've called the coherence of uh, Gandhi and the others in the group of seven. As we trace the roots of the modern Indian conceptualization of freedom, I find its earliest expression occurs in Swami Vivekananda's uh, profound thought. It was initially formed in the late 19th century. And Professor Raghur as we know, has written on Vivekananda as well, and is familiar with all of these others. It was Vivekananda's voice of freedom as a process of political and spiritual evolution personal and ethical transformation that inspired Aurobindo in the 20th century. And so we find not only Aurobindo, but M. N. Roy and his radical humanism, which is mistakenly viewed as antithetical to Aurobindo's philosophy, but they mutually evolved in their thought to write original, very similar theories on freedom in Roy's case, this is evidenced in his book, Problem of Freedom, published in 1945. In accord with others in this group of seven, Roy contended that, quote, internal spiritual freedom, not notably spiritual freedom is part of this, of individual morality. This gives the society an advantage of being built on solid ethical freedom ethical foundation and securing a firm base then of community with each person being provided with the new moorings of a cooperative collective existence and that's a quotation from Roy and uh, note the way in which he uses terms like spiritual freedom <clears throat> and ethics in politics now before turning to Ambedkar contribution to this group of seven. This should be stressed. Among the seven members of this intellectual constellation, the conceptual correspondences in thinking about freedom are striking. Evident differences definitely do exist among them in terms of their contrasting philosophy, but not, not when we focus on their ideas of freedom. So let's be clear on the case that I'm making for the cohesiveness of modern Indian ideas of freedom, that this grouping of seven thinkers is not intended to underestimate the differences, the real differences among them. The point is this, that these leaders of the Indian, of Indian political thought signify with their ideas of freedom, aspects of a vital and enduring intellectual tradition. And this was aptly termed an Indian Renaissance by both Aurobindo and M. N. Roy. And so now we come to B. R. Ambedkar. He is a fascinating member of this ostensibly disparate group. His harsh criticisms of Hinduism and Gandhi are well known. Less studied, though, is his interpretation and embrace of Buddhism in his marvelous work entitled The Buddha and His Dhamma. And so the following analysis of Ambedkar's thought here focuses entirely on this book. It's a singular work that he and his biographers correctly call Ambedkar's magnum opus because it marks the end of his theoretical journey at the climax of his rich reconstruction of Buddhism. So to be specific, Ambedkar's idea of freedom is the topic here and his thinking about it in Buddha and his Dhamma ranks as his major contribution in this group of seven. And by the way, I'm referring, referencing the outstanding edition of Buddha and his Dhamma by Rathor and Verma, published by Oxford University Press in 2011. I've read several editions of Buddha and his Dhamma, but Rathor's, I think, is by far the best. Now, there's a particularly dramatic instance of this idea of freedom in uh, the Buddha and his Dhamma that merits special attention. It occurs when 
And Baker relates what I'll call the allegory of the dungeon, thereby alluding uh, to Plato's famous allegory of the cave in Republic. The following passage from Buddha and his Dhamma comes when the Buddha is speaking to his disciples. And I quote at some length. The Buddha says, you must realize that the world is a dungeon and man is a prisoner in that dungeon. This dungeon is full of darkness, so dark that scarcely anything at all can rightly be seen by the prisoner. The prisoner cannot even perceive that he's a prisoner. Indeed, he has not only become spiritually blind by living too long in the darkness, but he very much doubts if any such strange thing as enlightenment can ever exist at all. Mind is the only instrument through which light can come to man. But know that the case of the prisoner is not as hopeless as it appears. For there is a, may, a thing called will in human nature. And when the appropriate motives arise, the will can be awakened and set in motion with the coming of just enough light to see in what directions to guide the motions of the will, man may so guide them that they shall lead to freedom. Thus, though man is bound, yet he may be free. He may at any moment begin to take the first steps that will ultimately bring him freedom. This is because it is possible to train the mind in whatever directions one chooses. It is mind that makes us to be prisoners in the house of life. And it is mind that keeps us so. But what mind has done, that mind can undo. If it has brought man to thraldom, it can also, when rightly directed, bring him to freedom. It only requires a free mind and free thought. End of quote from the Buddha and his Dhamma in the Rothor edition. Now, it is so striking to see the language in this allegory of the dungeon, as I called it, to Plato's allegory of the cave. The thought, the language, remarkably close. But there are also substantial differences. First, as you'll know from reading Plato's Republic, the cave allegory, which is the quintessential expression of Plato's thought. In this allegory, there is no conception of spiritual freedom. Indeed, no mention of freedom at all. Second, in contrast to Plato, and Baker asserts that Buddha is, quote, a born Democrat, end quote, devoted to freedom and equality for all, while at the same time serving as a guide to spiritual emancipation. Uh, this is also opposed to Plato, uh, but directly parallel uh, to the group of seven. This demonstrates M. Baker's interpretation of Buddhism as a perfect synthesis of internal and external freedom. And note that there is no binary thinking in M. Baker's thought. That is a kind of dichotomy of thought that's contrasted, for example, with Oxford professor Isaiah Berlin's well-known theory of the irreconcilability of or the essential opposition of what he called negative to positive freedom. Instead, and Baker describes Buddha's allegory as a progressive cognitive journey out of the dungeon, a steadfast pilgrimage culminating in spiritual freedom. And now we move to another central theme that should be recognized as characteristic of this group of seven. This follows from the dungeon allegory in that it shows how their ideas of freedom relate to their own personal and philosophical journey. Their lives read like archetypal stories of those in search of truth and with Buddha's legendary example, they tell their stories in terms of Buddha being the quintessential hero. 
These autobiographical narratives start, of course, with Vivekananda. He holds forth the Buddha as his archetypal hero. In all of the eight volumes of Vivekananda's complete works, dozens of references to the heroic char uh, character of the Buddha abound. Following Vivekananda, Aurobindo forges conceptual connections around the idea of freedom in both Hinduism and Buddhism. And like Vivekananda, Aurobindo valorizes the Buddha's quest. Buddha, Vivekananda's unstinting praise of Buddha's character is therefore echoed by Aurobindo, especially in his magnum opus, The Life Divine. Here he says as follows. And this is the longest quote from the life divine, which surely ranks as a classic of political philosophy, even of systematic political philosophy, if we accept then Professor Roger's excellent comment about the attempt to convert non systematic, so called non systematic into systematic. This is systematic. From the life divine, or have been no road. As the individual moves towards spiritual freedom, he moves also towards spiritual oneness. The spiritually recognized, the liberated man is preoccupied, says the Gita, with the good of all beings. Buddha, discovering the way of Nirvana, must turn back to open that way to those who are still under the delusion of non-being. Vivekananda, drawn by the absolute, feels also the call of the disguised Godhead in humanity, and most the call of the fallen and the suffering. For the awakened individual, the realization of this truth of being and his inner liberation and perfection must be his primary seeking. Uh, that's the end of the quote from Morabindo's Life Divine. What's noteworthy here is the theory of evolution of the individual in a journey of self-realization and liberation. Moreover, as in Aurobindo's Buddha and his Dhamma, as in Ambedkar's rather, Buddha and his Dhamma, external and internal freedom are correlates with Aurobindo because Aurobindo like Ambedkar saw humanity moving towards spiritual freedom. The hope for our future lies in an ongoing forward quest as seekers. In sum, Aurobindo extols Buddha's journey from riches to renunciation. And to quote from him, the elevation of universal compassion or karuna and sympathy for the whole earth is my family to the highest principle of action. This is spiritual freedom. The end of a quote from Aurobindo. This sets the scene for Gandhi's fascination with the Buddha's archetypal quest for truth and for spiritual freedom. In his autobiography, Gandhiji asserts that early in life, he read Edward Arnold's story of the life of Buddha entitled The Light of, a the Light of Asia. And a quote from Gandhi, he says he consumed it, quote, with even greater interest than I did the Bhagavad Gita. This appeal, the end of quote, this appeal to Gandhi of Buddha's theory and practice continued. So that 35 years later, in 1927, Gandhi delivered a series of addresses on Buddhism. And this started with a comparison between Buddha and Vivekananda, quoting that neither neglected India's starving poor. And then Gandhi focused on the significance of Buddha's transformative journey. To quote again from Gandhi, I feel even proud of being accused of being a follower of the Buddha. And I have no hesitation in declaring that I owe a great deal to the inspiration that I have derived from the life of the enlightened one. And then if we move forward in Gandhi's life, another 20 years to 1947, as both Indo Indian independence and partition years, Gandhi's commitment to Buddha's example increased as he urged everyone to follow in Buddha's path. Buddha personified for him an inclusive spirit, a transcendence of communal violence, 
as inward and outward freedom must come together in real or porna swaraj. The point here is obviously not to claim that these seven thinkers shared a total allegiance to the teachings of Buddha. It's rather to see how this group of seven viewed life's journey and Buddha's example especially as a quest for spiritual liberation and truth. They actualized this ideal within a common, vital, indispensable Indian intellectual tradition. The archetype of Buddha's lifetime transformation and search for enlightenment served as exemplary for the evolution of their respective intellectual journeys. Now, nonviolent means to their ends prevailed in this goal of inward with outward freedom. The Indian freedom struggle obviously demanded resistance to British colonialism and oppression. Yet it meant much more than this, as it was characterized by theories and by practices of nonviolence. The leaders transformed themselves as they gave their country a vision of peaceful inner and outer change not found in other major political movements because of India's path of nonviolence and Swaraj. They infused ethics into politics. But it required, as we can imagine and know, extraordinary courage to resist the Raj nonviolently, as well as to combat, to combat caste oppression or religious fanaticism. Nonviolence meant engagement with politics joined with introspective self examination. Some of these leaders experimented in politics more than others, but all all pursued their moral quests, their journeys in earnest. Now these exemplary leadership qualities in 20th century India, qualities of integrity and honesty, of civility and compassion should never be taken for granted either in your country or in mine, especially at this moment compare and contrast today's lesser world leaders as evidence of the superiority of the group of seven in the last century. And so India has left a legacy, an ethical vision that speaks eloquently to a planet locked today in divisive dogmatism, in endemic violence, in zealous demonization of the other and in pervasive fear of freedom. We ignore these historic examples from the last century of Indian leadership and ideas at our peril because the ways in which they pursued their personal or political goals personified a consistently commendable type of character and ethos of ethical insight. These were remarkable, truly remarkable leaders who demonstrated that moral visions can work in politics when applied by those who sought to know themselves to engage in a true pilgrimage to Swaraj. When in doubt, they paused for self-examination or nonviolent experimentation. Today, we are engulfed in demagogy. We tend to assume that lust for power or selfish pursuit of narrow interests inevitably characterize politics. This was not, emphatically not the case in 20th century India, where the Independence movement in thought was directed at a sense and a spirit of common interest. <clears throat> Excuse me. A sip of water. Thank you. An essential theory that cements this group of seven 
is that of the relationship of means to end. Vivekananda was once again the first Indian thinker to provide a crucial theoretical linchpin of this group when he began an address in Los Angeles in 1900. And I quote from Vivekananda, one of the greatest lessons I have learned in my life is to pay attention to the means of work and not to its end. And then he concludes this eloquent speech with language that became a signature theme for this entire group of seven. Vivekananda concluded, let us perfect the means. The end will take care of itself. Aurobindo's inspiration from this for this theory came as usual from Vivekananda. He formulated his philosophy of means and ends in the life divine with a vision of, to quote, the need of a humanity which is mission to evolve beyond itself. But to realize these desirable ends, Aurobindo said, other means then used conventionally must be adopted instead of the violent ideas or slogans and thrown to the exclusion of all other thought. It is evident, note this language of Aurobindo, who was nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature, by the way, in 1942, but in terms of the sheer eloquence of the language and the fact that this can be ignored universally, here's how he concludes. It is evident that a life governed by the right means opposes enmity, brutality, destruction, and violence, political strife with its perpetual conflict, frequent oppression, dishonesty, turpitude, selfish interest, ignorance, and ineptitude. In a future society of nonviolence, he concludes in the life divine, these vices could have no ground for existence. End of quote. Now, this theme of connecting the means and theory with nonviolence pervades Aurobindo's thought, evident in his, in his essays on the Gita, where he denounces war asserting that love is the only means to truth. So we must move to quote Aurobindo again from ethics, uh, from <clears throat> his essays in the Gita, towards, we must move towards the replacement of physical force by soul force, of war by peace, of strife by union, of hatred by love, of egoism by universality, end quote. Now note carefully Aurobindo's term soul force as the path to freedom, because as you well know, this explicitly relates to Gandhiji's definition of Satyagraha. Gandhiji's thinking from the time of Himswaraj stressed the primacy of using moral means, that is of ethics and politics. It was there that he wrote in response to an imagined adversary who could have been a terrorist. He wrote in Hinswaraj to quote Gandhi, your belief that there is no connection between the means and the end is a great mistake. Through that mistake, even men who have been considered religious have committed grievous crimes. Your reasoning is the same as saying that we can get a rose through planting a noxious weed. The means may be likened to a seed, the end to a tree. And there is the same inviolable connection between the means and the end, as between the seed and the tree. We reap exactly as we sow." End quote. He continued later, some will say that means are after all means. I would say that means are after all everything. As the means, so the end. Violent means will give violent swaraj. That would be a menace to the world and to India itself. There is no wall of separation between means and ends. End of quote. 
Now, by early 1930, Gandhi was, Gandhi was ready for a major test of, test of mass political action. So as you know, he embarked on the salt march with a select few of carefully trained and committed members of his ashram. There was no violence from Indian satyagrahis in this unprecedented civil disobedience campaign. So he could conclude that, to quote from him after, if we take care of the means of adhering to strict nonviolence, we are bound to reach the end sooner or later. If we resolve to do this, we shall have won the battle." End of quote. When Nehru reflected in 1953 on the distinctive trait of the Indian independence movement, in contrast to other political movements of the 20th century, Nehru concluded that, quote, Gandhi was never tired of talking about means and ends and of laying stress on the importance of means. This is the essential difference between the Indian movement and others. It's a mode of thinking unique to the Indian freedom struggle, end of quote. M. N. Roy's split with Marxism came over the issue of ends justifying means. The crux of M. N. Roy's break came with his assertion in 1946 that Quoting Roy, the truth is that immoral means necessarily corrupt the end. End of quote. This was the essence of Roy's new orientation, as he called it, after his own historic classic journey. Ambedkar is a systematic proponent of the means ends theory by emphasizing its core in Buddhism. With the logical rigor, typical of Ambedkar's work, he developed the idea throughout his magnum opus, The Buddha and His Dhamma. The following quotation from Buddha and His Dhamma sums up this philosophy of means end. So here is Ambedkar. The law of karma was enunciated by the Buddha. He was the first to say, reap as you sow the exact language that Gandhi had used. He was so emphatic about the law of karma in this respect that he maintained that there could be no moral order unless there was a stern observance of it. Since it is impossible to escape the result of our deeds, let us practice good works. Let us inspect our thoughts so that we may do no evil. For as we sow so we reap, again, repeating what Gandhi had said. But continuing the quote, what the Buddha wanted to convey was that the end of the deed was bound to follow the deed as surely as night follows day. And the end of the quote from Buddha and his Dhamma. Of course, Ambedkar did not interpret Buddha's theory of Dharma, of karma uh, to doom future lives to untouchability, nor did others in the group of seven. Like Gandhi and Ambedkar, Tagore's political thought saw the crucial importance of the means ends theory to any conception of nonviolence. Even as a poet, Tagore expounded a political theory that forged the relationships among the ideas of freedom and the means ends theory writing more on the idea of freedom than any other literary giant of India. After asserting what he called the fundamental unity between Buddhism and Hinduism, end of that quote from Tagore, Tagore connected this with the means ends relationship that he found and valued in both Buddhism and Gandhi. As a special tribute to Gandhi, Tagore wrote in 1930, to quote Tagore, Gandhi's emphasis on the truth and purity of the means from which he evolved his creed of nonviolence is but another aspect of his deep and insistent humanity to respect all life. To argue that existing rights were originally won and must be still 
maintained by violence, the Gore continued, is to create an unending circle of viciousness. This is wrong where there will always be men with some brutal vengeance or grievance who will claim their right to gain their goal through slaughter. Somewhere the circle has to be broken and Gandhi wants his country to win the glory of first breaking it through the use of nonviolent means." End of quote. And that was Tagore about Gandhi in 1938. As Tagore left the Soviet Union, in his trip in 1930, after viewing its experiment with communism, he warned the Soviets, quote, violence begets violence and blind stupidity. Freedom of mind is needed for the reception of truth. Terror hopelessly kills it. Therefore, for the sake of humanity, I hope that you may never create a force of violence which will go on weaving an interminable chain of violence and cruelty." End of quote. Uh, that was in 1930 before Stalin's great purges had actually even begun. And so think of how prescient de Gaulle was in courageously warning the Soviet Union in this same form that Gandhi would. Now, Jaya Prakash Narayan, everyone calls him JP, joins this group of seven as a synthesizer who practiced what he preached through immense self-sacrifice, personifying a truly relentless journey of ideas. JP came from a background of Marxism, like M. and Roy, and JP studied and researched it in depth in a formal university setting as it happens in the United States. When he became disillusioned over the failure of Gandhi's first non-cooperation movement in 1922, JP embraced communism as a solution. <clears throat> this led him to Roy's early writings. But then, like Roy, in the final phase of his journey, JP's prescriptions for revolution changed drastically as he and Roy ultimately rejected Marxism over the same issue of means and ends. Much more than Roy, though, of course, JP not only adopted Gandhi's ideas, uh, but earnestly tried to put them into practice uh, through Vinoba's Sarvodia movement, and then in 1954 by founding his own ashram for constructive reform in Bihar. In a momentous statement on the pivotal role of the means ends theory in 1948, JP realized that his own socialist party that he had led had taken a decidedly wrong turn. And so in his address to the party in 1948, which was entitled means and end, JP began by explaining, this is a quote from JP, a problem that has deeply worried me of late is the problem of methods or means. From time immemorial, there have been politicians who have preached that there is no such thing as ethics in politics. But since the rise of authoritarianism and totalitarianism, which includes both fascism, Nazism, and Stalinism, this principle has been applied on a mass scale, that is the principle of there being no ethics in politics, and every individual in society has been affected by it. This has resulted in such an eclipse of moral values from social life that not only its political sector, but every aspect of human life, including even the family, has been darkened. There are many things that Mahatma Gandhi taught us, but the greatest thing he taught us was that means are ends, that evil means can never lead to good ends, and that fair ends require fair means. Some of us may have been skeptical of this truth, but recent world events and events at home have convinced me that nothing but good means 
will enable us to reach the goal of a good society. At the end of the quote from JP. Ten years later, after subjecting his theories to Gandhian practice, JP explained what he called the end of his search for an ideology. In a speech entitled Back to the Mahatma, he asked, there's a quote from JP, how can this supreme task, a total revolution, be accomplished? The answer is, he places this in italics, by going back to Mahatma Gandhi, the leaders of the country must go to the people to live and work with them, to serve, guide, and help them. They must do all this not to strengthen their parties and gather votes for themselves, but in order that the people should rise and put their heads, hearts, and hands to the task of national development. That's the end of the quote. JP synthesized this whole philosophy further in his most important treatise entitled A Plea for the Reconstruction of Indian Policy. He set forth there his concept of total revolution at length, which I won't try to summarize here further. But it featured the interaction between leaders and led as cooperative and interdependent agents in the quest for Swaraj. This was the meaning of what he called participatory democracy, whether in the form of the constructive program, which he emphasized, or any other aspect of Satyagraha. So, if ever, there is a categorical imperative for combating authoritarianism by choosing instead to wage nonviolent struggle around the world, well, then let this be India's enduring message, that its independence movement showed us the way to freedom in its fullest sense by practicing it as pronounced by its foremost thinkers. The appellation of exceptionalism, which American authoritarians throw around so often, claims America is exceptional. But it's the Indian freedom struggle that is more deserving if such an assignation is ever merited. The claim should rest with the high quality of India's thinkers and their Indian intellectual tradition, the creativity, the unity and diversity. More than anywhere else in the world, a renaissance of political thought did occur there, as Aurobindo entitled his book, Renaissance in India. Later, Aurobindo passed uh, this with a judgment on Gandhi in 1948. He quoted the quote Aurobindo about Gandhi, the power of nonviolence that brought us through so much struggle and suffering to freedom will achieve also the aim which occupied the thoughts of the fallen leader at the time of his tragic ending. As it brought us freedom in the truest sense, so we hope it will bring us unity. Since my research started on Indian ideas of freedom in the early 1960s, rigorous scholarship of five major worldwide political movements of the 20th century has brought us each, has brought each of these movements into much sharper perspective. The mass movements, four mass movements of Russia, China, Italy and Germany may be compared more precisely now with that of India in the last century. The judgment of history should be clear. The ideas and leadership of South Asia were exemplary and truly exceptional. The idea of freedom especially proved distinctive. This concept assumed various forms among the group of seven political thinkers discussed here. Some, like Aurobindo and de Gore, took it to philosophical or poetic, poetic heights 
that have gained worldwide recognition. Gandhiji insisted that the idea be tested in the crucible of ceaseless creative experiments that subsequently spread around the world to impact other societies. Scholar activists like Ambedkar combined intense activism with high academic achievements. His pilgrimage went from denunciation of Gandhi to composing a systematic treatise on Buddhism that advocated the very values of nonviolence that Gandhi cherished, thus contributing mightily to India's intellectual tradition. Always these seven showed incredible freedom from fear, epitomized by Jayaprakash Narayan. And so in summary, uh, this group of seven shared a quality rare among leaders or thinkers of other political movements. Free from the corruption of power, they exhibited an eagerness to engage on individual quests marked by determined, unflinching introspection and insight to search deeply within themselves and experience personal as well as political transformation. From Vivekananda's momentous encounter with Sri Ramakrishna to M. N. Roy's departure from communism to radical humanism, these were journey periods rare in the arena, arena of politics. As we reflect on the other major leaders of mass movements in the last century, Stalin, Hitler, Mussolini, Mao, we declare never again. But when history judges India's nonviolent independence movement, we ask, why not again? The answer comes from the voices of its stellar visionaries, their ideas of freedom. Thank you very much for your patience and attention. I truly appreciate the opportunity, Sanjeevji, that you've given me. Uh, thank you, Professor Dalton. I think uh, this is an extraordinary, I think, uh, session that we are witnessing. Uh, I must say, uh, 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 through your inputs, uh, we do come across uh, to a very rich Indian tradition. Of course, we try to understand ourselves, you know, uh, from the Western categories and the way you brought the group of seven, you know, underlying the importance and the congruence between them, you know. Of course, uh, there are large differences when we come across them. Uh, so I think it's been a fascinating, you know, uh, treat. I think it's a treat for all of us, you know, who are here, you know, as scholars, students uh, listening to you. And I think uh, it's also great that we have Professor Raghuram Ji here with us. Uh, I think uh, it will be uh, befitting if he, he makes some observation and comments uh, on this uh, very, very, I think, important presentation. And of course, uh, we have drawn uh, uh, great lessons uh, through your presentation. May I now request uh, Professor Raghu uh, to share his uh, observations on, on the presentation. Thank you, Thank you uh, um, uh, Sanjeev. Uh, and uh, I'm completely bowled. So what, uh, what to say and how does one begin? Um, let me, you know, gain some wits and uh, 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 make some arbitrary beginnings. Uh, one way of uh, making this arbitrary beginning is to uh, recall, uh, uh, you know, two points that uh, struck me about uh, Professor uh, Dalton. One is the uh, the point that I mentioned about uh, he's one of the very early uh, academic warriors, uh, you know, who are trying to get. Indian, modern Indian thinkers within the academic platforms. And I also at that time said that uh, he uh, accomplished his job 
and i uh, welcomed him uh, as uh, you know as a warrior uh, who is returned uh, with a uh, lot of accomplishments and uh, one of the products of his accomplishment is you know people like uh, you know sanji you uh, me and all of us are uh, doing what we are doing i think you know i i i i, I humbly submit this uh, thing the second thing that i found uh, very interesting about him was uh, that uh, he not only asked the question is somebody a philosopher but can somebody be made into a philosopher and now this is what i already said now after listening to him uh, grasping for breath as uh, as it were let me just make a one baby step uh, forward uh by uh, stating that there is a new you know expedition or war that uh, he has already planned and that is i largely saw his work you know as for surrounding uh, 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 is is around gandhi now i find uh, him uh, including six more people and uh, you know if this is not a war at least this is a five day match with a long long innings so uh, i only hope you know i only i'm happy that you know the list will go on beyond 11 players uh, with a wicket keeper and uh, you know bowlers and batsmen some things like that so that is a feast for uh, new students who are uh, working in this area and looking for topics to work on but please remember that working on these areas is a very very arduous job as i mentioned it is not going to be using uh, the ready made material as if you are working on john rolls or jeremy bentham there is a ready made material and then you can join the stream as it were uh, like catching a next flight uh, you know from chicago to uh, you know new york but then uh, that is not going to work in this case because the students have to move from working with ready made material to making the material ready i think that is a very interesting and a very important caution without that caution you students can you know get themselves disappointed let me be very you know uh, let me not encourage students to work on these areas without these preparations they can really can get frustrated be very frustrated but if you plan properly um, you know uh, exactly like Uh, you know uh, um, uh, the european scholars uh, when they wanted to join either swami vivekananda or uh, uh, mahatma gandhi uh, rehearsed what is it to be living in india i think that rehearsing i think that's where what we can learn from you know these uh, uh, these people so now i think i have uh, some uh, foothold to make uh, my comments let me uh, begin by saying that um, Professor Dalton is now making more uh, advances towards uh, 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 and even is trying to traverse more ground, uh, more ground by relating the works of this uh, group of seven to larger national movement. I think this was not uh, very explicit in his earlier writings. It was more in terms of themes. so ideas and persons and uh, the ideas kind of a thing the uh, relation of these to the movement was very it was not there even if it was there it is not claimed you know as a very substantial kind of a connectivity now i find that uh, that would have just made that these are you know isolated thinkers who could be frozen and then made into islands and then you know you visit those islands work on them and come back and now he is dismantling in other words he is just rinsing this ice land ice cubes into you know uh, in putting them in in the water and they are going to dissolve into movements 
Now, in all living them into moments, there is a more extensive kind of uh, in a domain that one is now aspiring for to invade academically. I think that is the you know additional point that comes out uh, I know in this lecture very clearly. What is an additional point? In passing, he makes a reference to the differences between American independence and Indian independence. America was handed over by the uh, East India Company to the native settlers, whereas they didn't want to do that kind of a thing in the case of India. And interestingly, very interestingly, um, that India was handed over by the British, not to the princes, not to merely politicians, not to uh, you know revolutionaries. It is handed over to lawyers. And I think that is the one of the distinguishing feature that marks. There is no country in the world which is, you know, which which whose a you know uh, freedom struggle happened to be happened to have two important markers. One, the people who received the lost country that was lost were not politicians alone. They are trained lawyers. You know, they became politicians later. All of them became politicians later. So you have this, this hardware, you know, of a legal hardware, which is provides a platform for receiving independent India. Many people argue that there is a tragedy of uh, the uh, you know partition of India. But please remember that when British entered into India, it was not one India that they took and we made into two. You know, there are several Indias here. So that is, you know, that is the kind of a thing. So there is, he's hitting that a very important distinguishing feature between Indian independence movement and other independent movements. Now, I think he's drawing that he's assigning distinctiveness, uniqueness to India's independence by relating to the kind of works, ideas in this group of seven. I think that's how I look at the general framework, <clears throat> the architecture of this second move. <clears throat> so if that is uh, uh, the way in which one could proceed. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, now, now, within that uh, framework, I wanted to uh, make the following point. The following point is that uh, the relationship between any two, it could be between two people or between two phases within a particular person can be very interesting. The relationship between two can be governed either by similarity or by difference. So please remember in Professor Dalton's presentation, now, despite, I mean, you know, I mean, uh, keeping aside the very rich details and the kind of a collection, connection that he makes, the assemblages that he comes out, the kind of slants that he makes uh, here and there, the crucial two points in my reading, I may be wrong, but in my reading, is that both similarity and difference are back into the discussion and you have to look at them now. How you look at them is going to define your future course of action. So now there are two important you know, people, ideas that are on your table, and now you have to respond to them. Now, how do we do it? If certain things are similar, then you, you, can, you can have both. If they are different, then the problem is, Either you have one or the other. Either it's circle or square. Either it is black or white. But if you want to have both, then it is as difficult as squaring the circle. Squaring the circle. So now the decisive moment is that we are all now called to make our stand clear with regard to similarities and dissimilarities. 
and now at a global level when philosophy east west conference took place at honolulu uh, muir had uh, uh, who called the meeting they decided and started this journal called philosophy east west to bolster similarities between different cultures especially eastern cultures and western cultures eastern philosophies and western philosophies the entire project of the journal was that they will now highlight what is common between the east and the west you have a plato and then we have a you know uh, uh, shankara you have hegel we have shankara that kind of a parallels are promoted at that time but when they met second time uh, then they have changed their policy and then they said now now the general policy of philosophy east and west will be not to highlight similarities but differences and this has the impact of foucault knocking at the doors you know of uh, dismantling the convergences politics of convergences and then highlighting the importance of similarities so there's a policy decision about difference moving away from similarities to differences and then there, there have been uh, sporadic uh, uh, attempts uh, here and there but then what is important in today's presentation is that professor dalton i think has this at the back of his mind but then he is now dealing not with two different cultures eastern culture and western culture and establishing whether similarities or dissimilarities that is the concern you know which took us in some other direction but his concern is more native more domestic more focused his concern is to look at the differences between or amongst several indian prominent thinkers who might call writers none of them are authors okay so how does one look at those differences what are the consequences of highlighting differences is division the excessive idea of a difference excessive difference can relapse into divisions it can divide people and once it divides then there is a possibility it that that consequences does not you know is not a good thing it can give you identity it will not give you a place it is not progressive in some in, in one way of talking now taking a clue on this particularly with reference to uh, gandhi and ambedkar people like dr nagaraj you know came up with the works to show that no there is a mutual uh, you know interaction between uh, each uh, each of them don't slaughter them into this compartment and that compartment and isolate them and see that they don't talk to each other so don't make this as a you know angry rooms of uh, uh, people who will where the communication is disrupted in actuality dr nagraj has shown these are the people who even they despite the strong differences kept on talking to people kept on talking to each other kept on talking to each other is in this context i am uh, i'm i'm uh, and i want i want to bring it to your notice there is a very interesting book called truth called them differently published by namajivan press where they try to look at the differences between gandhi and tagore and many people including the editors of that uh, thing kalekar and uh, 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 then they are very apologetic about that differences you know they are apologetic saying that you know they are like children saying that you know oh god it's like you know mother and father fighting with each other and then we don't know what to do with it kind of a thing now that is the kind of you know emotional kind of a moment in the in that kind of a thing where differences are looked at as an embarrassment now i think professor dalton's attempt to highlight similarities comes against this background where he is now saying no there is a larger 
you know, braid which is similar. There is a larger platform on which they all converge in contrast to the, their Western counterparts. For instance, he gives uh, uh, in a very systematic uh, way that they all converge on how important is means to end. For some, he said, for uh, M. N. Roy, means is everything. You know, forget about uh, uh, you know means learn ends have to be compatible. Means itself is a is the most important thing. It's almost like analytical statement. If you know a mean is good, you know that end is good. Like A is A means, you know, you don't have to know uh, the predicate to know about the subject. If you know the subject, then you know what is a predicate. It's almost like that. Or the imbricated relationship between the inner and the outer. How important is inner for the outer? They can't be separated. Okay, this is contra Machiavelli and other kinds of people. So these are the points that he makes in that, uh, in that kind of a thing. So now the similarities circumvent the differences from relapsing into divisions. Now, the question that I wanted to pose before you is that it's a remarkable, there is a, you know, underlying this presentation or at the back of this presentation, you have a streams and layers and layers of for these, you know, little theoretical U-turns, uh, U-turns or you know, Y junctions, uh, and with a long uh, duck kind of bridges built, uh, and uh, you know, aerodromes flew from one aerodrome to other aerodrome, Vivekananda to M. N. Roy, M. N. Roy to these. It's not an easy job uh, to uh, to do it, and he's done it, you know, in a very, 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 very brain point. I want to make a critical uh, suggestion to Professor Dalton, namely, <clears throat> yes, the uh, um, excessive differences will lead to, will relapse into division, which is not desirable. So there is a larger call, immediate call to establish, to save from this and establish similarities so that this relapsing is circumvented. This relapsing is circumvented. I quite see that point. But my submission to him is that what is the purpose, what is the teleology of similarity? How do you dispose of the differences? Now, I find in my little reading, that in Indian Nyaya tradition, a very interesting insight from this Nyaya scholar called Akshapada, who says that difference is the fundamental requirement for a debate. That you don't debate, you know, what similarities. You debate, debate dif differences. Okay? But the qualification for somebody to differ from the other is she or he knows about the other more than the other knows about his or her own position. So this is a requirement imposed on about the cognitive competence to deal with differences. Look, similarities require, you know, psychological and moral, you know, attitude towards the other. But Dealing with differences require higher cognitive competence <clears throat> to engage with them. And these differences, in my reading, have to be repositioned from relapsing into divisions, but leading to debates. This is one gesture that I want to submit. I once again want to thank um, Professor Sanjeev for uh, uh, asking me to be here. As I told you, that I am not qualified uh, because I am, uh, you know, uh, I am uh, I am inspired by Professor Dalton, and I am really thankful to Professor Dalton for this exciting and accelerating presentation, which has several ramifications for all of us to think about. Thank you once again.
Thank you, Professor Raghu. Uh, I think uh, uh, Professor Dalton would like to respond uh, to some of the concern that you have drawn on his presentation. Uh, but uh, thank you for beautifully summarizing the whole discussion. And of course, uh, to Dal Professor Dalton, uh, bringing uh, the group of seven and then trying to traverse their journey, you know, uh, their intellectual journey. In, 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 in 60 minutes, I think that also speaks volumes in terms of how a theorization can, can be drawn. And uh, for that, uh, we are richly indebted to both of you, you know, Professor Raghu and Professor Dalton. Uh, I'm sure there are, you know, many, uh, you know, uh, amongst the audience, there are many eminent scholars, professors, students, you know, uh, who have keenly, you know, been uh, listening uh, to this conversation between the two, you know, very, very sound intellectual scholars, you know. Uh, so they must be having some, you know, observations, comments. Uh, so uh, I would now request uh, Biprajit, our friend, uh, to uh, to moderate the uh, question and answer round. And Professor Dalton, uh, if you wish to come, if make your observations now, or else you would like to pick few questions, you know, and then uh, we'll respond. Uh, 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 I think uh, it's up to you to decide uh, because Professor Raghu has already raised uh, very important concerns. If you like to respond to him directly, or we can take few questions, you know, for which uh, I would request Biprajit uh, to carry the proceedings forward now. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Yeah, Someone thank else. you. Prof okay. Yeah. Now, one aspect of Indian thought that I like is that it strives for both and and not either or. And in terms of how I should respond, I would like both respond briefly to the magnificent comments made by Professor Raghuji uh, and also to those who I see flashing on the screen, including my dear friend, as I've said, Dr. Rajiv Kadambi, because Rajiv did warn me ahead of time uh, that um, Raghuji would be a formidable critic and commentator. And, uh, Professor, you have definitely lived up to your reputation. I am in awe of the piercing and constructive comments that you've made. So very briefly, when you, I think rightly, call my attention to the need to compare political movements in a more perceptive and in-depth manner. Yes, I agree, each one of these movements, whether the American independence movement, or Hitler's movement, et cetera, uh, need to be studied in historical uh, context and depth. But what strikes me is the distinctiveness of the Indian independence movement because of its commitment to nonviolence, which the group of seven uh, seem to be university, university acclaimed. Um, but you're absolutely right on that. Uh, I like so much your images when you uh, talk about the ice cubes melting in the water and, and the U-turns uh, that are made. I think that uh, these are all brilliant and extremely constructive. I do stress the similarities in the example that you've chosen among many uh, between uh, Gandhiji and Tagore, I think is very important uh, because of the superb example of uh, two people who maintain the most close and intimate friendship and yet could differ in such strong terms, in terms in the way that you indicated, uh, I find very, very few examples of such civility in other movements. And uh, especially, of course, uh, when I'm thinking of, once again, my preoccupation is with an American, as an American, with the divisiveness and incivility that occurs here. If only we had today, which is unthinkable, the two uh, leaders, political social leaders of the stature of Tagore and Gandhi, debating one another in a civil manner. It's almost unthinkable. And that's what I find so distinctive about the extraordinary quality of the integrity, honesty of uh, these people. Uh, Tagore and Gandhi, their language is utterly eloquent. Their imagery is superlative. We yearn for a return to that. And that, those are the similarities 
that I wish to introduce into the ethics of politics. If, if I could think on my meager knowledge of examples in Russia or Germany or China or America, definitely America, of this kind of eloquence being conducted between de Gaulle and Gandhi, in politics, in ethics, we don't have it. And that is our problem today. Uh, so that's uh, one thing uh, that I wanted to say. The other is that students, in order to appreciate Gandhiji, must read uh, your book, your reader of your many publications, which I've already mentioned to you three times just tonight, because I, I see it as a revelation of the way in which similarities and differences can be handled in a subtle philosophical manner without resorting to language or accusations or whatever uh, that's uh, so true. Um, your book, right from the very first, I was so happy when you began with a, an essay from my former teacher, colleague, mentor, A.L. Basham, uh, the classic essay uh, that he wrote on Gandhiji, uh, which was called Traditional Influences on the Thought of Mahatma Gandhi. This essay should be reprinted everywhere. And I think that you've done a service to it. Uh, and you raise a crucial question when you say, um, sorry to be quoting back to you what you've written, but nevertheless, I'll do it. Uh, when you say Basham's essay, which is conspicuously absent in the mainstream discussion of Gandhi is important as it exposes the limitations surrounded, surrounding these other interpretations of Gandhi. Basham, as my teacher, you know, who happened to read my PhD essay thoroughly and criticize it, as so as on the, the comparisons among Gandhi, Tagore, Vivekananda, and, Ga and Aurobindo in 1965, as my teacher, he argued forcefully for the similarities among these four, and then I extended it to seven. And you can imagine why, and that is because he had such a fundamental respect for Indian culture he was in love with it as I am. And that kind of affection, that deep reverence uh, for what India produced, especially in the last century, that came from a Western British classicist, deeply grounded in Sanskrit. And so as you uh, say in this essay, uh, or in, in the essay says itself, Basham says, the fundamental concept of Gandhi's philosophy owes nothing to Western sources. Now that needs to be responded to, I think. And in the essays that you've included in uh, this volume, there is really no one essay uh, that takes Basham to task on this, on this question of the fundamental similarities that all come from the Indian intellectual tradition that he so powerfully made. If I may make a suggestion to you, the next, I hope that this will be succeeded by another volume of essays, whether I'm Gandhi or not. Uh, there's another essay that I heard Basham deliver uh, in, uh, at SOAS in 1962. It's an earlier essay than the one you include. It's um, called Some Fundamental Political Ideas of Ancient India. And there he commends scholars to look at these fundamental ideas of ancient India and the way they lay, they establish a groundwork for what is to come. And that is to, and the, and the similarities, the profound similarities as distinct from West to West among these ancient thinkers. It's a too long a passage for me uh, to quote, um, but uh, his conclusion is beautiful. And that is, he says that among all of these, Government is not an end in itself. There is only one final end to which all valid human activity should serve as means, the achievement of inner peace, if we may interpret moksha in similar secular by each individual. Uh, that's what India is all about for me. And we need to remember that as we uh, go to the situation that we have in India and America today. Uh, it, uh, then commend not that you need commending, but 
to underline the importance of Basham's insights, beginning as a classicist with the fundamental similarities. And he specifically mentions the similarities between Hinduism and Buddhism. This is my argument for the similarities. And to ask you, Professor, why is it that Basham's essay has been neglected? Why is it that you are virtually the only one to reprint this essay? And even you don't, can't produce a response to the essay. And my answer to that is there's a reason why differences are sometimes applauded or emphasized over similarities. And I take Ambedkar to be an excellent example of this. Why is it that there is so much attention given to his pamphlet on the annihilation of caste and so little attention given to his magnum opus, the Buddha and his Dhamma? One reason is because the first, that is annihilation of this caste emphasizes the differences between Gandhiji and Ambedkar. The other does not. And that's why I want attention drawn to this question of a mentality that emphasizes differences over similarity. But this hardly responds to the profound remarks and inspiring suggestions that you have given to me tonight. And I am truly indebted. Thank you. And now if we could move, if you wish, uh, to other questions. Thank you, sir. Uh, um, may please I take over? Can, yeah, please. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, again, uh, greetings to both Professor Dalton and Professor Raghuram Raju. And uh, thank you so much uh, to both of you for your informative insights and um, dealings with the, especially Professor Dalton with the seven uh, great personalities that you have talked about. Uh, we have some questions and we are expecting more. Uh, but before we move on to that, uh, uh, some things that we, I would want to specify. Uh, we are not uh, entertaining a lot of direct questions given the uh, time constraints that we are dealing with. And uh, also we do not want to hold back uh, both professors for a longer time than expected. Uh, moreover, uh, kindly send your questions uh, to the chat box. If we see uh, questions of same na uh, nature, then uh, I'll try and uh, couple them together and ask one single question to whichever professor uh, the question is targeted to. Uh, for both of you, uh, professors, uh, if either of you feel like commenting or adding on to an answer given by either of you, uh, then, of course, you're free to do so. And uh, you can just uh, maybe give me a heads up as to you would want to comment further on any question that has been already answered by either Professor Dalton or Professor Raghuram Raju. Uh, we have certain scholars uh, amongst us in the form of Professor Ashok Acharya, Dr. Y.P. Anand. Uh, till we receive further questions, uh, so, uh, professors Ashok Acharya ji, uh, Dr. Y.P. Anand ji, and all of you have joined us from various institutions, various parts of the country and elsewhere. Uh, if you have anything to comment, if you have anything to add on or ask to both the professors here, kindly uh, switch on your mics and uh, feel free to ask and comment. Any, uh, any professor, any scholar who has attended us, we have a lot of them, in, as I can see in the participants list. Um, if you have anything to ask to both professors, you may do so by uh, unmuting yourself and uh, asking a question or commenting upon the presentation that was given by both Professor Dalton and Professor Raghuram Raj. So Roy, may I speak? I'm Dr. Nehata. Yes, please. Yes, uh, first, like, uh, I'm really grateful for this session. Thank you for the, uh, doc, like, Professor Dalton and Raghu, sir. Like, uh, it was really immense knowledge I had today from the session. So I just wanted to ask, uh, like, uh, Dalton's uh, view on the Gandhian economics thought at the present scenario, like, in the present economic conditions, so present global economic conditions. So if he can specify some of the Gandhian economic thoughts uh, in this scenario, so I'll be grateful to listen. Yes, as you know, Gandhiji had a way of expressing his thought in a very pithic, cogent manner. And so in terms of economics, he said uh, that 
economic equality must be the master key to independence. And then he went on to say, the planet has enough for everyone's needs, but not to satisfy everyone's greed. And I think that that's a key component of one of the three pillars of Swaraj uh, that Gandhiji emphasized. You remember I mentioned them and you know them. And that is first, abolition of untouchability, second, Hindu-Muslim unity, and then what he stressed, economic equality. Now we face throughout the world, in the United States as much as any place else, an egregious, disgraceful disparity of wealth between rich and poor. Gandhiji said that we must <clears throat> overcome this in his own land, uh, that is the thing of Swadeshi, uh, but also elsewhere. And that I want to emphasize is at the root of my own commitment to Gandhiji over the years. I find very few American speakers emphasizing the need to overcome the fundamental disparity of wealth that exists in my country. It certainly exists in India. I've lived in Indian villages uh, for years, the time beginning in 1960. And uh, I know the disparity exists there and the terrible consequences it's had in terms of COVID. It does exist in the United States and in other countries as well. Gandhiji's solution to this, that is to address greed and avarice, and the way in which it has led to a multiplication of wants rather than a satisfaction of needs, that is our remedy today. And we must urgently follow it if we are to solve any of our problems, whether of climate change, race, whatever. That's what he wanted. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am and sir, for your answer. Uh, we'll move on to take one question that we've received uh, in the chat box. Uh, the question uh, is from Dr. Simple Mohanty. Uh, she asked that, uh, in your opinion, which uh, Western philosopher, if there is any, shared the focus uh, that the same uh, seven persons have talked about in your presentation uh, shared on both inner and outer freedom, along with also on both personal and political transformation. So there are basically two tangents to this question as uh, you're being asked to equate a certain Western philosopher, if there is any, who shared the same focus uh, or the attention uh, of the seven grades or the seven persons that you talked about in your presentation on the question of inner and outer freedom, one, and two, on the question of both personal and political transformation. Thank you for stating the question so clearly. It has a direct answer, and that is there is none. Uh, that is, I've taught political theory at Barnard and Columbia for 40 years, and the canon, the Western canon, had to be the focus of the political theory course that I taught from Plato to the present. And I found in Western political theory, none to compare uh, with Gandhiji or with the other thinkers that I had. I must, I might say that I've had long conversations about this with Jayaprakash Narayan, whom I knew personally and interviewed at length over a period of 10 years. And I have ultimate admiration for him. He was extraordinarily sensitive uh, to Western political theory because he had studied University of Wisconsin, et cetera. And uh, he knew uh, just exactly the deficiencies in Western political theory. And he emphasized at this point, and that is uh, that Gandhiji gave him the attention to means and ends, as I said in my lecture, uh, but also the way in which we must think seriously about addressing the problem of disparity of wealth <clears throat> and inner and outer freedom. This cannot come about until there is a self, serious self-criticism among America's thinkers and leaders about the kinds of lifestyle that they live and the way in which they must then limit their wants in accord with their needs. 
believe me, I have seen in the United States this basic principle of Gandhi violated again and again. I'm 83 years old now, and I deplore the way our culture is heading. We need, as Jai Prakash told me, and as he wrote, we need to return to the message of Mahatma Gandhi. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Professor Raghuram Raju, would you uh, like to add on something or uh, comment further on the same question? Yeah, on the, uh, the first question uh, about uh, Gandhi economics, I think uh, the, the, the one way to, um, you know, contextualize or maybe, you know, rewrite in a new idiom uh, the distinction uh, between the need and the greed uh, that Professor Dalton uh, alluded to about Gandhi is that, uh, you know, for uh, social scientists in India, uh, there is something that happened which is unprecedented in the world during the pandemic. Uh, people ask, you know, uh, the question about, um, uh, or, you know, what is a need and what is a greed? Okay, during the lockdown period, you have a situation where most of the people in India have shunned the greed and they lived on the needs. You know, limited rations. You know, we had a lot of suffering, but then, you know, if you can delineate that, that part of it, you know, what is it that can make people survive? Okay, so now the Indian social scientist should have grabbed that uh, opportunity. It is almost like, you know, having a doctor uh, doing a cesarean or uh, operation where, you know, you just freeze the entire body and then do it. Now, during the time, if you have taken a village or a, any, uh, any street in, a, in Delhi and asked people, how did you live? What is the minimum that you consumed and you still survived? I will not talking about people who did not survive. We know, you know, there are a lot of people who did not survive, migrant laborers and all that thing. But there are people who really survived with minimum medical attention, with minimum kind of a thing. If you can just take that slice, you would really know what is capitalism in its using of, uh, you know, individual centeredness, uh, damaging the individual through its greed. Okay, that's one lesson that one could look at it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Professor Aguram Raju. Uh, we have one more question after this, uh, and uh, this question is uh, quite common, uh, if I can say we have received this in the past uh, lectures that we have received. Uh, the question revolves around uh, the fact that how can we universalize the Gandhian thought of uh, nonviolence um, as it was selective through the Indian national movement and also universalize the uh, method of protest that Gandhiji used in today's time? That is in the 21st century. This question has been asked by Deepankar Bharadwaj. So the question again has two tangents as to how we can uh, universalize the Gandhian idea of nonviolence and the Gandhian method of protest in, in the current context. Thank you for that question very much. We were encouraged and uh, optimistic about Arab Spring. Now in today's news, uh, the latest report seems to be that the last country, Tunisia, has fallen, as it's described, uh, from its attempted democracy into authoritarianism. Very sad indeed. And I think that the reason why Gandhiji's movements were not emulated enough, except with the exception of Martin Luther King, uh, in which I participated in the civil rights movement, where King did manage to emulate Gandhiji. I think it's because what Nirmal Kumar Bose, one of my mentors, I don't know whether you may have heard of him, but he was a truly great Indian anthropologist whom I worked with in the 1960s, and also uh, Lal, his personal secretary. Uh, these are people that have influenced me profoundly. They both said that the distinction must be made between Satyagraha and Duragraha. Gandhi made that distinction very clear in his writings. There was Satyagraha 
uh, which had to adhere to strict nonviolence in the way that Martin Luther King spells out the theory of nonviolence and the practice of nonviolence in his book. So it can be done elsewhere, but it has to be strictly nonviolent. And uh, Dura Gra, uh, which is not only passive resistance, but sitting Durna and that kind of attitude mindset uh, that allows a movement to, for, to move, move apparently forward, even though there is anger and bitterness and spite there. And I think that when a movement goes downhill, as it has in uh, many countries outside of India, the Arab Spring countries being a good example, but also in this country, uh, that is with the Occupy movement, if you're familiar with the movements in the United States, and now I'm afraid with Black Lives Matter, I hope that's not the case because I've participated in Black Lives Matter movements, but I think that we may be on a downslide the, from Satyagra or the attempts at Satyagra to Duragra. Now, what precisely is Satyagra? And then what exactly is Dura? What is it that emphasizes, that, that, differs, that differentiates them so profoundly? It's a state of mind. With Satyagra, there is nonviolence not only in action, but also in thought and in speech and in language. There is a purity of nonviolence. With Duragra, as Gandhiji said in his writings over and again, uh, there is an adherence not to true integrity and civility, but rather uh, to malice, anger, maintaining within oneself and heart a sense of resentment and vengeance and vindictiveness. Well, that's doom. I think we must strive to adhere to Gandhiji's very, very staunch commitment to nonviolence in thought, language, and deed. He said this clearly in terms of anger, hatred, etc. They can be harbored in a movement that is supposedly nonviolent, but is to use near Malcolm Moore's near, near Mal Bose's words, a counterfeit, or what Pyarlal told me, beware counterfeits, beware Duragra. And that's what unfortunately we have had worldwide as well as sometimes in India. So this is the distinction that I want to make in explaining why some nonviolent movements most nonviolent movements fail because they do not staunchly, strictly maintain the kind of nonviolence that I saw with Martin Luther King and uh, with Gandhiji and then with the others in the group of seven, especially Jaya Prakash and Ryan. Thank you so much, sir, for that answer. Um, we move on, uh, we'll not take too much time on this. Uh, we'll move on to uh, another question that we have. This question revolves around a more common idea, the idea being the oceanic circle, um, as talked about by Gandhiji himself. Uh, the question comes from Aisha as to uh, that Gandhiji believed in the idea of oceanic circle rather than the pyramid structure. So is it possible to follow Gandhiji's theory of oceanic circle? that revolves around uh, touching the grassroots, giving them the state, uh, status of a republic, uh, the entire uh, broader idea of individuality. Can we touch upon that theory of oceanic circle in the current world, given all the circumstances and situations that uh, exist right now as we speak? It's an excellent question. And I want to quote what Gandhiji said himself about this. He's envisaging the kind of India that he wants. And he says, in this structure composed of innumerable villages, that is Chayati Raj, there will be ever widening, never ascending circles. Life will not be a pyramid with the apex sustained by the bottom, but it will be an oceanic circle, as you rightly said just now, whose center will be the individual always ready to perish for the village, the latter ready to perish for the circle of villages, till the last, the whole becomes one life composed of individuals never aggressive in their arrogance, but ever humble, sharing the majesty of the oceanic circle of which they are integral units. 
uh, that vision is impeccable. If we try to find it in Western thinkers, we do not. Uh, that is, the problem is that most thought, Western especially, is given to competitiveness and the way in which we are one culture trying to up the other. That kind of violation of Gandhiji's equality and the vision of the oceanic circle is fundamental. Now let's look at it very briefly for sure. Gandhiji was against centralized government. His last testament, remember the Congress, was to disperse into decentralization and to have a Lok Sevak Sang, that is, units, Chaiti Raj, that were highly decentralized. When a country becomes too centralized in its corporate structure or in its government, then it undercuts the fundamental principle of decentralization. There is too much centralization in the nation states that exist in the world today. We need more, as the image suggests, in terms of oceanic circles. We need more responsibility assigned to the individual in a particular unit, a small unit. The nation state system has to be broken up and in some way decentralized. Uh, that's been said to some extent uh, by various economists in the United States and Britain. And uh, Schumacher, for example, in Small is Beautiful, uh, one economist who has said it, you, you know his work, I'm sure, yes, uh, Schumacher. Um, but there's not enough emphasis upon nonviolence in Schumacher and in others. We have to as we strive for a society uh, that is given to decentralization, we must do it nonviolently without coercion and allow the individual full room to speak for herself or himself. That's true autonomy for the individual. There is so much that the world needs to learn from Gandhiji at this time. And so with climate change especially, is there time to revolutionize, as JP said in his total revolution theory, is there time to revolutionize when faced with these crises that we have? That is the question. There's no doubt in my mind that the answer is what Gandhi specified, but not it's, it's not solved quickly, as Gandhi would say. And the time is of the essence. Timing is all. Thank you so much, sir, for your wonderful answer to that question. Thank um, you. We are now moving towards uh, the penultimate question, or, the, or rather the last question for today's session. Uh, and finally, it's a bit longer one to say so. Uh, I'll try to break it down as much as possible so that you can answer it uh, with proper understanding of what the person wants to ask. Uh, this question has been raised by uh, Sandra Singh. Uh, the fact is, uh, we need to, the question is on the idea of freedom, the common idea rather. Uh, and uh, while she says, the questioner says that she agrees on the idea of moving from internal towards external freedom, she asks you that, uh, do you think that to attain internal freedom for the deprived section, it requires an external freedom to choose and attain the means to self-discovery and transformation? This is the first part. Second part is, and a continuation, how can one free themselves from the physical miseries to then attain an internal freedom from their own vices or miseries? To substantiate her question, she gives the example of the Bengal famine and as to how that moral upliftment in times of Bengal famine becomes only secondary to the physical requirement of food and health care. If you want me to repeat the question, I can. Well, that's a profound question. These questions are very challenging and uh, need to call on a usual 
Professor Raghuji in terms of answering uh, this one, because he has probably much more wisdom than I do on this. Uh, but anyway, the point is this, uh, that if we look at Gandhiji's own life in terms of the journey, uh, the journey was accomplished in spite of massive persecution. And uh, Ashish Nandi has spoken of the way in which Indian, the Indian minds were colonized in a brilliant essay. And obviously, I see Professor Raghu has, who has had the wisdom of including uh, Nandi's brilliant essay on assassination, Gandhi, in his volume. So uh, that the idea is the journey. And the journey is often then represented in terms of overcoming terrible obstacles. I think for a moment of what Ambedkar achieved. It's almost unbelievable. Maybe it is unbelievable. He was born in, as you know, into a Dalit misery. And uh, he is then supported, you might say almost magically, by a patron. And he winds up at Columbia University after having distinguished himself. And he learns at Columbia University from John Dewey, returns to uh, India, brings all of his knowledge from Dewey and other Americans to India, writes the Indian constitution, mobilizes the Dalit community. It's almost unthinkable that a, as I keep using the word unthinkable, unimaginable, that a person would achieve so much in a lifetime. And then the culmination of his work, not satisfied, of course, with what he has already done in terms of writing the constitution, but the culmination of his work is that he writes his magnum opus about Buddhism, a splendid exposition of it, and reiterates the very values of the Indian intellectual tradition that he had earlier denounced. Now that kind of overcoming of obstacles answers, I hope, your question. And that is the inner journey. The unexamined life is not worth living. The inner journey is often achieved. Maybe because of the obstacles, but certainly in spite of the obstacles. And we can only gasp in awe at some of these achievements and the way in which they have continually occurred among Indians not only the group of seven, but among many Indians. What I try to say in my teaching, I'm still teaching as a volunteer in high schools. What I try to say to my students in their teens is that you think you are facing obstacles. You think that you are in some kind of position of anxiety and undue pain. Well, look at Ambedkar. If you want an obstacle, and it faced with an institution of untouchability that he overcomes through a majestic journey of his own, we gasp in awe of that kind of achievement. Now, Gandhiji also, of course, went through his. And when I'm most, what I'm most fascinated by in terms of perhaps all of these similarities that I've tried to sketch, is the nature of the journey that each individual went through. It's utterly fascinating. That is the way in which Vivekananda, as a young aspiring lawyer, meets Sri Ramakrishna and the change that occurs. And then all the way through the change that occurs in Tagore's mind. If you want to read a truly magnificent description of the way in which an individual's mind will change from a spirit of trivia to a spirit of elegance, read Tagore's description of what happened to him at age 18, when he, in a flash of revelation, suddenly perceived the unity of all being. And he describes it in two places, uh, especially in his reminiscences at length. It's, it's majestic. So where do these individuals come from? that can achieve this kind of, to go back to, uh, to the excellent questions that uh, Professor Rago raised, the teleology of similarity and all this, what, what is it that can produce these extraordinary journeys, revelations 
on the part of these individuals and so similar in terms of the way in which they lead to a particular view of freedom and of human unity, unity of all beings. That's the question that we need to ask. And I think that unless we get the answer to that, unless we face the challenge that people like Ann Baker faced and overcame, then uh, problems like climate change, which seem abstract and distant, they will not be solved. Thank you so much, sir. Um... That's fairly, maybe a very well put answer to a fairly long question. Uh, before we end this session, uh, the question answer session, Professor Raju, any uh, winding comments or any uh, observations on all the questions that have been asked and answered by Professor Dalton? No, thanks. All right. Uh, to everyone, uh, we have not been able to accommodate all questions given the uh, time constraints that we are functioning with. Uh, but thank you so much for putting down your questions and uh, we'll try and uh, find a way to maybe get them answered. Uh, till then, uh, thank you to both professors for, for your patience and for your answers given to the questions. And uh, thank you so much for conducting this lecture. Uh, professor, uh, professor Kumar, to, over to you. Sanjeev, sir, you may take it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Biprajit. Uh, thank you uh, for taking this session ahead. Uh, indeed, uh, it has been a treat uh, to have two very extraordinary minds uh, engaging us on the rich uh, legacy of Indian intellectual tradition. And certainly, uh, the discussion will inspire you know, many uh, to pursue non-Western theory uh, with more passion and vigor uh, than we have done in the past. Uh, in our quest to knowledge. Uh, the fact that uh, more than 200, you know, audience uh, joined this discussion and several others on the Facebook, Facebook and Twitter, uh, where the event is being screened live is indeed very satisfying. Uh, uh, I can't thank Professor Dalton enough. Uh, you know, it, it has, it was a very in, uh, insightful and thought provoking presentation uh, I'm reminded uh, that due to the pandemic earlier, uh, we had to cancel this event, uh, but you considered our invitation to join again, uh, despite your other pressing engagements, uh, providing intellectual and moral support uh, when it was most needed. Thank you indeed for this kindness, sir. Uh, we look forward to have you in our future engagements and wish to learn uh, much from your experience and wisdom. Uh, for enriching the discussion uh, with his deep knowledge on the subject. Uh, I thank Professor Raghu Ram Raju. Uh, it was a pleasure uh, having you as a chair, and I, I, I am hopeful that this conversation will continue with you in the times to come. Thank you so much, sir. I'm thankful to our principal also, Professor M.A. Beg, for some technical reasons uh, he could not you know, be with us. Uh, but he has always been kind in supporting us in all our initiatives. Uh, much of the pain in organizing this initiative has been taken care uh, by a dedicated team of students, you know, volunteers, and of course, many faculty members of Gandhi Study Circle who in a way constitute our important pillar. Uh, many distinguished scholars, you know, from India and outside, colleagues, friends, you know, they joined these proceedings today and of course, we can't thank them enough. Uh, we are truly benefited from the rich discussion uh, that followed through this lecture. And for this, uh, I thank all the participants. Um, uh, I look forward to seeing you all in the next series of lecture uh, that we plan to have in the near future. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Dalton uh, Professor, and Professor Raghuram Rajan uh, for this uh, generosity and support Thank you indeed. Uh, it has been a great learning experience for all of us here uh, in the country and especially Professor Dalton. It is late evening there, you know, it's a supper time and you have stayed back. Uh, thank you indeed. And Professor Raghuram Rajan, I uh, think sorry, uh, you took time and joined us this proceeding. I think uh, this will be, uh, I think, continuation 
of a journey. I think I don't think this concludes today. It will be a long, enduring, I think, rich experience of learning from both of you. And of course, our students and other uh, members who joined today have been truly benefited from your uh, rich experience. Thank you indeed. Uh, would you say something or otherwise we will well, uh, uh, call it? Yeah, if sorry. I, if I may say something, although Professor Raghu definitely has more to say, I'm sure, but I, it is always for me to thank you, Sanjeevji, uh, because of the way in which you have shown us how uh, conferences of this kind and uh, meetings among minds can enrich our study of Indian, the Indian intellectual tradition and of Gandhi. Uh, you have led the way. And uh, certainly it's been part of my journey and that of many others. So I want to reinforce you. You know how much I value the book, the edition of Gandhi essays that you produce because <laughs> you know the review that I wrote. And at any rate, uh, I want to emphasize the importance of what you've done as a scholar and to appreciate so much. Uh, Professor Raghu, if I had another five or six hours, I might be able to address some of the criticisms that you've made so profoundly. Um, but I'll think about them, I assure you, and to continue to work further because you are truly a philosopher. I'm merely a political theorist. And I really appreciate the way in which you brought so much genuine wisdom uh, to this exchange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Professor Dalton speaks for, uh, for, for all of us. Uh, so I also thank Dr. Sanjeev and it's such a nice, uh, you know, meeting Professor Dalton in face-to-face uh, uh, -face like this. So it's a rare opportunity for me and thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Indeed, I'm truly humbled, you know, uh, by, by the observations made by Professor Dalton. And of course, I look forward uh, to continue this discussion. Uh, thank you all uh, for your patience, you know, and your valid contribution to this session today. Uh, the session uh, concludes now. Thank you all. Good, good, good night to Sir Professor Dalton. And of course, uh, good day for all in India. Good day. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.